Thank you very much. And uh, welcome, everybody. So today, I really want to challenge everybody. I want to challenge this audience. And I want us to think about innovation maybe in a different way. How do you innovate at scale? What motivates most of us to innovate? Certainly, we could make a lot more money in a lot of cases if we worked on Wall Street or we were bankers. I think a lot of us are doing it to try to improve society. And so how do we do that? Can it really be done just between a customer and a company? Or do we need to have a bigger vision? A bigger vision where we work with our government entities, co countries, and really across the entire value chain to create value. And so you, all here as innovators, I challenge you from the start on this is what my talk is going to be about. So I love history, and how could we not tilt our hats to Thomas Edison here today? This is a famous bet. It's a bet that was made between Henry Ford and Thomas Edison. And the bet was, which type of car would be more successful, an internal combustion vehicle or an electric vehicle? So we have some auto people here. And a lot of them know that Henry Ford's first car was actually an electric vehicle. They also know that in the 1900s up through the 1920s, there was like an arms race going on about how you're going to make basically a horseless carriage. There were hybrids invented at that time. There was a company called Woods that made a gasoline electric hybrid. There were steam-based cars. There were all sorts of, of capabilities. So they made this bet famously. And at the time, clearly, Ford won. And Ford won because he understood that fuel in an internal combustion engine was a great storage medium for energy. He didn't understand that that had other ramifications. And so a problem that we all face as innovators are, sometimes we advance society but we create other problems when we do it. And in this case, we all know what that problem is. We have congestion problems. That was a problem that's been mostly taken care of at this point around just the pure materiality of the vehicles and what happens to them at end of life. And of course, there's what we do to the atmosphere. So all these. Now Edison may be proven right still yet. He argued electricity. His argument was very, very sound. Electricity can be made from really any energy source. So it's got this sort of fungibility and how you produce it. The piece he missed, and he's famously missed this in the 1920s, was energy storage isn't where it needs to be. So, so think about how very simple technologies change society. And water is such a good example, it's hard not to talk about. If you think about back prehistoric times when people were nomadic, they moved to water sources because they were following food and they needed fresh water. It was really a big innovation when people figured out how to make containers and to, to make wells, it really allowed them to move from being kind of hunter-gatherers to ag an agricultural type society. Then if we think about it, we're standing in New York City. Of course, the Greeks and the Romans invented aqueducts, but the ability to move water and move it efficiently and cheaply allowed big city centers to form. Now that creates some new problems. If you were here in the 1800s, typhoid, all these waterborne diseases were wiping people out. It kind of limited the size of the cities that were around. And if you look at each of these innovations, you see these getting bigger, populations going up. So what happens? Chlorine. Chlorine goes in, disinfects the water. Population goes up again. Today we have these mega cities being formed. They're in China, Latin America, even in our own country here on the West Coast. We see water shortages now. We're simply not using water efficiently enough. So the next level of challenges that are required to move are going to be around water reuse, water efficiency, low cost ways to make potable water. Again, every innovation benefiting society. And in this case, it's very clear that each one of them benefits society more than the, than the downside that it brought along, because we can see population improving. Cars, what a great topic after this morning. We've got we had Bob Lutz here talking to us about congestion. He talked about his view of the future. It's a great example. So, New York City today, or any major city, couldn't exist if there weren't automobiles because there'd just be too many darn horses. And it's true. We couldn't feed all those horses. They'd be emitting a lot of greenhouse gases because animals do, right? It would be a cesspool of disease, frankly, right? And it was when there were a lot of horses. So the car fundamentally changed society. It gave us more space to live in. It really allowed our lives to change. And again, look at the car come in. Up it goes, up goes population, up goes the quality of life for everybody. And I have to admire the car companies. A lot of people pick on them, say they're big and slow and they're not visionary. But these guys do think at scale, especially today. They have it right. They go work with government. And they think about, how are we going to make the world better? So a good example has been around emissions. Emissions are a big problem. Anyone who was in Los Angeles 20 years ago, and even today, you can see that issue. 
If you go to China, you see it big time. Some of it's caused by industry, but the, automobile pop, the automobiles are part of the problem. So emission standards have been being really driven globally by partnerships between private industry, governments at a global scale to try to drive the CO2 emissions and the total fuel efficiency higher. And there has been major improvements, and we can see it here in the United States as well as in Europe specifically. Along with that, at the same time, if we think about uh, automobiles, they've gotten fundamentally safer. Every year, car fatalities go down. We heard about sensors. There's structural changes. These guys have gotten really good at making sure that if you make a mistake, crash your car, you're not going to die. You're not going to get maimed. You're going to walk away from that accident. So they've improved safety. They've kept the cost of these things down. And they've been improving the efficiency overall. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, about sort of the problems that that, that that created. To do that, you're going to have to put cars together differently. You need a product that allows you to make a car lighter, put a car together in a way that when it crashes, it holds its integrity together. Problem with welds today, if you took steel and you did that, there's sort of some limitations. So if you can make a continuous bond, you're able to channel energy in a crash in a safe way. So you're able to make a car lighter and safer. So what we came up with in Dow was an adhesive that channels crash energy at the same time allows a different way of putting cars together. So that allowed lightweight steel construction and has been transferred into bonding to similar materials, such as composites or aluminum, which allow further lightweighting. That helps solve the CO2 problem without a safety deficit. Everyone here has at least one cell phone. I bet if I made everyone turn all their electronic devices over to me and we weighed them, that we probably have about 500 pounds of electronic devices in this room. So think about that. Where are those all going? So we've seen the pictures of people burning them to try to salvage metals off of them. These things aren't, there's not going to be fewer of them. There's going to be more of them. And so that creates a whole new set of problems. Has that been looked at holistically yet? We're starting to see that. One of the areas is around removing heavy metals from them. There are some heavy metals inside your devices. And one of them is lead. Lead makes a great solder. Lots of wire connections need to be made. So you want to remove lead from these devices so that they're more recyclable, more environmental friendly, and have a better footprint. One of the products that we developed here is called Silvertron TS6000. Nice name and all, but basically it's a lead-free solder. It allows a fast way to assemble electronics, gets the lead out of the system. Think about lead in this country. Lead's not used too many places anymore. We're all walking around with it. It used to be in gasoline, used to be in paint, all gone. So this helps us get lead out of the system. So here I'm going to show you, a, show you a video. Last week, our company announced what I think are some of the most ambitious sustainability goals of, of really any company out there. And it really is about working together in the value chain and with global partners on both policy and inside of uh, government entities to solve world problems. So with that, can we watch a quick video, please? Sustainability has a history at Dow that goes back to 1995 and our first set of decade-long goals. It also has a future, bright and bold, outlined in these seven goals that challenge us to go beyond our current capabilities and the reach of our technologies. Leading the Blueprint. Develop a global strategy for a sustainable planet that integrates public policy, solutions, science, technology, and value chain integration. Our icon, or visual representation for this goal, uses diamonds that symbolize government, business, and society. United, they form a circle suspended inside a cubic system, showing the need for teamwork on the path to sustainability. Delivering Breakthrough Innovations. Deliver breakthrough sustainable innovations in chemistry that advance the well-being of humanity by delivering a six-fold net positive impact on sustainable development. The greater than icon signals optimism for the future, with colors representing branches of science coming together to make sustainable innovation possible. Advancing a circular economy. Facilitate the world's transition to a circular economy by redesigning things formerly thought of as waste into new products and services. This initiative is represented by an evolution of the recycling symbol. The circle represents a continuous cycle, outputs becoming inputs in a system of perpetual motion and opportunity. Together with our partners, Dow has the opportunity to shape what humanity will look like decades from now, a responsibility that belongs to every one of us.
DAO, Redefining the Role of Business in Society. So I hope you all found that inspirational. And also think about one of the last messages. We all have a responsibility. So a lot of us, we feel responsible for our companies and our bottom lines. It's really about society overall. And I think we can all think of examples where we've tried to move society forward and we've made some missteps. And so, you know, looking holistically is key. I love history if you guys haven't figured this out. This is another great picture. Does anyone know who's all up there? So again, we have Edison. We have Ford. We have the President of the United States. Can you believe the President's camping, by the way? So there's Harding on there. And we have Firestone. And they famously went together camping to actually talk about how were they going to scale the automotive industry. Now think about that. This is in the 1920s. They were doing this. These guys think at scale. This is how we have to attack problems. I, I do love that they went camping. <laughs> because I can't imagine my CEO or our president doing this. <laughs> so let me give you some other examples. Food. We all, we're going to hear, I think, later today also about some food opportunities and how to produce food more effectively. About 30% of all food is lost in transport. So we can improve the food supply of this world by simply making food transport more efficient. We've developed uh, products, which you're going to hear. It's called Pax Ex Expert Packaging, where the goal is to simply reduce spoilage, reduce weight and packaging, and allow food to be delivered, to deliver in a more sustainable way. Great example here is around milk containers. This is actually started in Latin America, where we sell rules of, of basically flexible packaging for milk. They're able to be shipped in a very efficient way to the dairies. They're filled up. Now they look like a bag of milk. And they're able to be shipped with, basically, or shipping almost all milk. Very little weight for the packaging overall. Health and wellness. So we mentioned earlier about, about challenges with waterborne diseases. The longer we live, the more diseases we find. And in fact, our friends in the pharmaceutical industry have done a great job finding many new therapeutic drugs that could be used on us. There's one problem. Our body doesn't want to take them into us. So we have to really work on how do we take those drugs and we make them soluble. This is one of our products. It's actually at Fernandez and Award called Afinosol. And it's targeted specifically at broadening the, the breadth of, of products that can be put into your body and really help the, directly help our own health and wellness. And this is an excellent example. This isn't very high-tech stuff, right? This is a bar of soap. It's a bar of soap that was co-developed with Unilever. Uh, it's Lifebuoy soap. Many of you probably know this soap. You know that uh, particularly in the developing world, disease from not hand-washing uh, kills infants. Literally, there are millions of deaths and disease that come from not being sanitized, you know, not sanitarily hand washing. The problem is soap is expensive. You know, a bar of Life Boy is about 10 cents. In the developing world, that's expected to last somebody a month. And in fact, there's enough surfactant and, and product there that you could wash your hand for a month with this. The problem is, and many of us have experienced this in our bathroom, the soap gets mushy, especially in a tropical climate. It gets all crumbles and it disappears. If that happens to you, and that 10 cent bar of soap is all you can have for, for a month, it's gone. You can't wash your hands. So we worked with Unilever, and we developed this Polyox product, which basically keeps that soap hard and delivers the cleaning power so that that bar of soap lasts a month. And it's delivered globally at 10 cents. So again, not terribly sexy, some of this stuff. Not, not very flashy, but it's stuff that matters. It fundamentally changes the world, and I challenge each of you as innovators, we're here today. How can we work together? How do we work? And do we elevate our conversations of our problems to our government officials and help them set wise policy on how they fund research and where they direct their precious dollars and energy towards helping society? So with that, thank you very much.